thank you very much for inviting me again. It's always a pleasure to be here in Seattle. This is um, it's a very special city. Um, it's very liberal. They're very city left uh, like that. It's also quite exciting to be the first one of the new series. Unfortunately, my speech is not going to be uplifting. It's actually going to be quite shocking. So I must apologize to begin this new season with such a bad news. This is not a very nice world we live in. And I think we need to learn what is happening in order to improve it. Um, I must confess that um, when I was asked to write this book, this book actually was commissioned. Um, the, my publisher in Japan came up with the idea that I should write a book about kidnapping. It's an area that, where there's very little available. It's also an area um, full of mystery. Um, so the idea was that I would be the best person to do that because of my connections with members of various armed organizations because they spoke to me because of my knowledge and also you know, my past in researching this uh, topic, terrorism. Um, I was not very happy, to be honest, initially because I felt like I was going to go out of my comfort zone, uh, which is you know, of course the area that I know. But also I felt that it was going to be quite disturbing as a topic. Um, to research. Uh, in the end, I did it because I'm very curious. <laughs> so I really wanted to know what's happened really when people get kidnapped, what's happened in the negotiation. I mean, we know so little, very, very little. And um, just a few months ago, I realized how important it was to do what I did. Um, I have um, a very good friend who runs a bookshop uh, in uh, Montana, in Hamilton, Montana. And through the years, you know, I've seen his son growing up because every time I have a new book, I go there, I give a speech. Um, so all of a sudden, this uh, child is now 17 and he wants to go and explore the world. And uh, his plan is to go and spend four years across the world, North Africa, um, the Middle East, uh, Asia, in order to see the world, but at the same time to help refugees. So the parents, they, of course, encouraged the son to do that because I think it's extremely honorable. I think it's also very exciting for a young American to go and see the war, especially imagine somebody that grew up in a, in a small town in Montana. But they were concerned about the fact that, I mean, this is a dangerous world. So they asked me to talk to him. So I discovered, number one, that he had no plan at all about how to go about. So his idea was, he was so enthusiastic. His idea was, okay, you know, I'm gonna get to Europe, then from Europe, I'll get to North Africa, then from North Africa, I'll get to the Middle East. And I said, well, I'm gonna second. I mean, where do you want to go? So he gave me the list of the countries he wanted to go. And uh, I cross most of these countries because they're too dangerous. They're absolutely too dangerous. So he, and I explained him why, and of course he didn't like it. He did not like somebody like me that he knows very well to tell him that actually the world is a very dangerous place, that it's not so easy to help the others, that sometimes by helping the others or wanting to help the others, you actually damage yourself and also other people. So in the end, what I did, I gave him the book to read. <laughs> so, so mm, as soon as I finished the book, which was you know, last spring, I sent it to him. He read it, his mother read it, his father read it, uh, and then uh, they sent me a beautiful email in which the father said, this book, it was, so sounds like a letter written to my son. Uh, and that really, all of a sudden, made me realize that um, what I have done is almost something for young people, just to show them 
what the world is about because really most of the young people have no idea how dangerous this globalized world actually is. Now, I never thought that this book and my research was going to be a sort of a guide for the, for the youth that wants to travel the world. I always thought that what I was doing was to link, to find the interdependencies between kidnapping, so the ransom, and human trafficking. How the two things go together. How you know, the money produced through kidnapping of foreigners, uh, so we're talking, of course, about Westerners, um, then are invested to build up a system that traffics human beings. But in reality, most of the people that get kidnapped are young people. Because you know, they go visit the world, explore the world, and you know, they, they fell prey of the kidnappers. But also, most of the people that are trafficked, most of the immigrants, most of the refugees are actually young people. Young people who are leaving their countries because of political destabilization, because of anarchy, because of you know, terrorism. So, uh, to a certain extent, yes, this is a letter to young people. And that really touched me, I must say. That made my effort worthwhile. So that's why I wanted to share with you this story, because um, there is so much that we still need to know, and there is so much that still needs to be researched, especially in the field of um, kidnapping and human trafficking. So <clears throat> what I've discovered is that in the last 20 years, we've seen the return of a, a breed of criminals, uh, which I describe as the merchants of men. Um, these are people who buy and sell human lives. Um, these are people that we thought did not exist anymore. We thought, you know, with the abolition of slavery, with you know, modernization, uh, all of this had disappeared. But in reality, <clears throat> these people have come back. And they have come back because of two main factors. So the root causes of this increase in the number of people being kidnapped in the last 15 years, and also in this massive amount of people trafficking <coughs> migrants from the south to the north, um, is actually linked to two main factors. Number one, 9-11, and number two, globalization. So let's have a look at this. Well, um, if you remember, that the first uh, decision that was taken by the White House after 9-11 was the introduction of the Patriot Act. Patriot Act is an anti-money laundering legislation, which um, what did, it disrupted the flows of cocaine, but also money laundering from, you know, uh, Latin America predominantly to the US. All of a sudden, US banks were prohibited to doing any business with offshore facilities. But also, the US monetary authorities had the power to monitor every single dollar transaction taking place anywhere in the world. So, money laundering in dollar became a big problem. At this point, the cartel, the Colombian cartel, had to find different ways to export the cocaine, of course, you know, to Europe, because it used to go via the US, and then the money were money laundered in the US, but also different way to money launder all the amount of profits generated by cocaine. And the solution came from a, a Colombian a guy, the name was Salvatore Mancuso. He was the head uh, of a paramilitary group um, at that time. But the interesting thing, he was of Italian origins. His family was actually from Calabria. So he had very strong ties with the Italian uh, <coughs> organized crime, in particular with the Calabrian organized crime. So an agreement was reached uh, between the Ndrangheta, which is the Calabrian organized crime, and um, the cartel, and the agreement was that the Italians uh, would money launder 
all the profits of their cocaine in euros. They would do it in Europe, but they also would do it in Asia. Uh, now, of course, 2001 is the year in which the euro came about. So there was this new currency which was readily available in order to money launder. But at the same time, the, car the <coughs> Italian uh, organized crime asked to handle directly the sale of cocaine in Europe. So a new route was found, and this route went from Colombia to Venezuela, from Venezuela on small planes, the cocaine would reach West Africa. West Africa, Guinea-Bissau, became the most important country because he, he had a certain kind of infrastructure. For example, um, it was completely flat. He also had 27 small um, places where small plane could land. Um, they were left there by the colonizer, the <coughs> Portuguese. Um, it also was uh, a country in a complete destabilization, as many of the West African countries uh, after the, the end of the Cold War, most of these countries were bankrolled by the Soviet Union, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they, they plunged into total anarchy. So it was very easy for the cartel to come into this country and basically buy the country, uh, buy the election, and all of that. Um, but then you know, the problem was, you know, how was the cartel going to take the cocaine from there to Europe? And then they discovered that there were smuggling routes, very, very old smuggling routes that would go from West Africa through the Sahara Desert, through the Sahel, which is the region south of the Sahara and you know, north of Central Africa, all the way to Libya. Mostly they went to Libya, but also to Algeria, so to the uh, Mediterranean coast, the African Mediterranean coast. Um, so this business uh, started by 2002. Interestingly enough, the people that were handling most of this um, smuggling were former members um, of jihadist groups, which at the time, of course, were former members of the Mujahideen, people who had fought in the anti-Soviet jihad, uh, you know, together with Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan, who had returned home in the 1990s, uh, and they wanted to bring about uh, another jihad, but of course they had failed. So most of them had ended up you know, in South Sahara, and they were surviving uh, being smugglers. So they smuggled cigarettes, they smuggled any kind of product they could between you know, North Africa and West Africa. Then all of a sudden the cocaine comes uh, and <laughs> is big business. So these people start making money, uh, start also recruiting more and more, uh, because all of a sudden the cocaine business became uh, the most important economic source of sustenance for the entire region. Then uh, <coughs> one day, uh, at the beginning of 2003, um, one of these uh, jihadists, which we could describe uh, as smuggler jihadists, uh, um, from Algeria thought, well, maybe you know, there is something else we can do in this region. Maybe you know, we, smuggling is not the only business we can do. Why don't we have a go at kidnapping some foreigners and ask for ransom? So they kidnapped 32 Europeans uh, in Mali, part of them in Mali. They were tourists in Mali and <clears throat> in southern Alger Algeria and also in Mauritania. They started to negotiate with the governments for the ransom and they got six million euros in exchange. That was the beginning of the kidnapping business. With this money, they founded a new organization which is called Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. You must have heard of it. That's the beginning of the hunting season of foreigners. Now, all of a sudden, the leadership of um, Al-Qaeda, which was, of course, in Afghanistan. Now, there are no links between uh, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and the traditional Al-Qaeda, of course, because Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb was founded uh, by people that simply wanted to emulate 
what Al Qaeda had done. But they got no money from them. It was completely self funded by the smuggling and by the kidnapping. But nevertheless, uh, <coughs> their success was so incredible that the traditional Al Qaeda, so we're talking about uh, Al Zawahiri, who at the time was uh, <coughs> the leader, they were so impressed that they issued a sort of communicate to all the members of Al-Qaeda, to all the jihadists who follow them, saying, look, why don't we all do the same thing? Why don't we all start kidnapping foreigners and asking for ransom? So that became known as the Al-Qaeda Indograb Protocol. And you can see that through the years from 2003 onwards, uh, the number of people that are being kidnapped has increased exponentially. And most of these people were kidnapped by jihadists. Now, these jihadists in reality are not, <clears throat> I wouldn't describe them only as jihadists. I think this can be, these people can be described as sort of criminal jihadists, meaning uh, they pretend to be part uh, of an organization like, you know, of course, Al-Qaeda, but in reality, <clears throat> what they do, they commit crimes in order to make money. So they're much closer to the model of organized crime, I would say, that you know, they are at the model of, <clears throat> of the jihadists. Um, now, um, it was very easy from 2003, I would say, in the Sahel until um, 2008, to the, even 2010, it was fairly easy for them to kidnap people because people did not know that those areas were dangerous. Go, and this is why I said at the beginning of this uh, talk that we need to know more. Because the idea that maintaining silence around kidnaps, kidnapping uh, is the best way to save people, is the best way you know, also to bring people back home, is actually completely wrong. Um, keeping all of that in silence, so without talking about the danger that people may run in going to a certain place, uh, we're actually <laughs> producing more and more praise for the kidnapped person. So people went on holidays in Mauritania, trekking in Mauritania, and they were kidnapped. People went to concerts in Mali, and they were kidnapped. And this went on and on for several years. Then all of a sudden, uh, aid workers started to be kidnapped. Now, the more countries pay ransom, the richer these groups became. The more they could recruit, so the larger their group became. So they could spread all over the Sahel. They could travel for hundreds and hundreds of miles in order to snatch somebody that was important. Then you know, they started to talk with different uh, organizations in order to find who was the best possible person to kidnap. Members of the United Nations, for example, were kidnapped. So, and it goes on and on because people did not know. We didn't read it in the newspaper. Everything was kept very quiet. But at a certain point, of course, people start realizing that going on holiday to Timbuktu in Mali to see the beautiful ruins was not a good idea. So all of a sudden, the number of people that potentially could be kidnapped started to go down. So these organizations started to look at different ways to still make money out of people. They had the infrastructure, let's not forget, they had the big infrastructure of smuggling. They also had the big infrastructure of camps where they kept the hostages, and then all of a sudden they looked at this flow of migrants, which was starting to become quite serious. Now, of course, the cocaine produced also an acceleration in the process of destabilization of Western Africa. So more people started to, to leave from Chad, from Mali, from all of those countries where you know, they could not uh, survive. And where did they go? They wanted to go to Europe. So they had to tr 
to traverse the same area. This, they had to travel along the same routes where the cocaine was traveling. Then all of a sudden there were two different uh, <coughs> systems. One system was for the cocaine, so they used the, the newest vehicles to carry the cocaine, and then they used the old one you know, to carry the people. And the criminal jihadists started to run that, that business. And this business became, um, very soon, more profitable than the business of kidnapping, but also of the business of cocaine. And I'll tell you why. Because in the business of cocaine, they only carried the cocaine. They did not own the cocaine. So the cartel was pocketing most of the money. In the business of trafficking people, they actually controlled everything. So their profits were much higher than, you know, traffic, than smuggling cocaine. It's extremely interesting to see how they shift from smuggling to trafficking people. Now, one interesting thing that happened at that time also was um, there was an agreement uh, um, between the Italian government at the time was, of course, the Berlusconi government and Gaddafi. Because these migrants kept arriving to the southern coast of Italy, and of course, you know, Italy didn't know how to handle it, Gaddafi um, and Berlusconi made an agreement that Ber Berlusconi would um, help Gaddafi financially. Um, so a lot of money were actually given to Gaddafi, including also um, whatever he needed, uh, for example, radars to control the crossing from, um, from the south of the Sahara into Libya of vehicles carrying the <coughs> migrants. But the agreement was that the migrants would be stopped in Libya. So the migrants were kept in a sort of modern uh, gulag, uh, horrible, absolutely horrible place. Uh, and they were kidnapped inside Libya time and time and time again. And the families had to pay each time more and more money for them to be free, just to be free for a little bit, to be then re-kidnapped by the traffickers and by Gaddafi <coughs> regime. Now, of course, the Italians knew that. <coughs> Um, so, this is um, very bleak, um, that's the Sahel, West Africa. East Africa, more or less the same story. Piracy, you remember all, you know, when the pirates... So, piracy is a little bit different though, it's a little bit more sophisticated, because in the case of piracy, um, piracy is more expensive. I mean, you need to, uh, number one, you have to, to have people that know how to navigate the sea. So you have to have sailors. Uh, number two, you have to have ships, which cost money. So the structure of piracy, <coughs> although it's similar to the <coughs> Al-Qaeda and the Maghreb protocol, is a little bit more complicated. Um, so there's always a, a group of investors, very rich investors. Generally, they come from the diaspora. And these investors uh, are the ones who actually put the capital up front in order to get <coughs> the group of pirates, but also you know, to get the ships. Um, then uh, the investors will pocket um, between 60 to 75, depending on the situation, of the profits of the hijacking and also of the kidnapping of the crew. In the period between uh, the hijacking and the payment of the ransom, uh, the pirates uh, get into debt within the local community. So if you look at this, uh, it's very similar to how modern financial capitalism works. You leverage, you use the leverage in order to make money. So you borrow from the investors, and the investors have this high return. Then the rest you borrow from the local communities, uh, sometimes a very high interest rate. Then when the ransom comes, the money are divided immediately. So one part goes to the investors, one part goes to repay the local community, and whatever is left over is divided among the pirates. Now you can see that this is a system that 
involves the participation of the community. So all of a sudden, piracy became the number one resource for the sustenance of the economy of Somalia. As in the case of smuggling and also trafficking in the Sahel, this was the only way that the local population could survive. So they did not look at piracy or at smuggling cocaine or trafficking in the Sahel as a crime. They actually look at it as a blessing because it gave them enough to survive. This is what's happening in highly, highly destabilized areas. This is how criminality actually becomes the source of life and also the accepted source of life. Same story happened, of course, uh, in uh, Somalia, that all of a sudden the, <clears throat> the various cargo that were traveling along the Red Sea and, and in front of the coast of Somalia. They started to travel with armed guards. They also had escort, uh, with armed escorts. So all of a sudden, uh, piracy was not as profitable. So piracy was uh, booming, really, from 2011 until 2014. 2014, the number of hijacking went down tremendously. So the pirates ended up doing exactly the same thing of the criminal jihadists in the Sahel. They just looked around for another business where, of course, there was focus on human beings. And that business was trafficking people from East Africa to the Gulf, to the rich countries of the Gulf. So we're talking about Kuwait, Qatar, but also Saudi Arabia. Uh, most of the business was done <coughs> crossing from a region called Puntland, which is you know, the tip, let's say, of <coughs> at the end of the Red Sea, so it's the tip of the Horn of Africa, into Yemen. And the distance was you know, very, very close. So that's what they, they, they did from 2014 until, of course, the war in Yemen started. And then from then, they started to go around. So they will go now to Oman. So it's the same story. Um, very, very similar. So most of the time, these people, they're trafficked, they <coughs> get kidnapped. They're also um, sold as slaves. Um, uh, the stories are identical, absolutely 100% shocking. Now, the last <coughs> uh, region that has been plagued by this kind of phenomenon is Syria. So 2011, <coughs> um, from 2011 to 2014, kidnapping was one of the most important sources uh, to sustain the civil war for everybody. So rich Syrians were kidnapped by the regime of Assad. Um, they were kept uh, in the Assad prison, and the family had to pay a ransom in order to free them. Um, the insurgency kidnapped foreigners, so journalists, um, aid workers. Um, most of the time, the journalists were kidnapped by the people that took them inside Syria. So the so-called fixer or drivers, uh, they pretended to be members of the insurgency, um, offering wonderful stories, but in reality, these were people that wanted to kidnap them. Um, the difference <clears throat> that there is between Syria and the other um, uh, countries uh, before is actually that in Syria, a very well uh, organized secondary market for hostages was developed. So. Um, what happened was that uh, certain groups started to specialize in kidnapping foreigners. Uh, so you would cross into Syria, um, and all of a sudden, you know, after half an hour, uh, they would come stop your car, uh, drag you out, uh, and then you know, that was it, you, know, you were kidnapped. But these were small groups. Uh, most of these groups were, again, linked to the fixers or the drivers that would take the people in, they didn't even speak foreign languages, so they could not even negotiate with the governments. So what these groups did was sell the hostages 
to the big, big groups. There were two main big groups, as you know. One is al-Nusra, uh, which was the one linked to al-Qaeda, and the other one was the Islamic State. Now, these two groups uh, um, had the structure to um, negotiate uh, uh, for the ransom, of course, because um, they, they were cosmopolitan, they had people coming from all over the countries, so they could speak the language, but above all, they had the money to keep the hostages until the ransom had been agreed. Um, a hostage is a very expensive merchandise. Um, you have to feed him, I mean, generally, actually, they barely feed them uh, because they save on food, but you have to make sure that the hostage doesn't run away. So you need people in place all the time to control where the hostage is to make sure that the hostage stays put. So it's, it requires an infrastructure that a small criminal group does not have. But, of course, an organization like the Islamic State uh, uh, can do that very easily. The interesting thing about the Islamic State is that the Islamic State was actually the organization that paid the most for hostages, uh, um, but not because the Islamic State uh, is the organization that um, has netted the highest profits in the negotiation of the ransom. Because for the Islamic State, the hostages had the political value. So here we see a, a departure from the criminal jihadist model that I described before that was typical of the Sahel and also, of course, of the, <coughs> the pirates. And we get into a completely different scenario. The Islamic State is not an organization that wanted to make money. It's actually an organization that wanted to build a state. You had a very strong nationalist <coughs> narrative behind it. So the hostage became uh, an instrument uh, of diplomacy. Of the 25 uh, Western hostages, uh, very few were actually beheaded. Most of the others were exchanged. They were exchanged before the beheading started. The Islamic State netted, we don't know uh, exactly, but it's between 60 and 80 million uh, euros. Um, so, it's quite a lot of money, but it's not a phenomenal amount of money. The people that were beheaded were worth more dead than alive. And that is a key issue, because we had never seen it before. That's the first time that <laughs> kidnapping actually consider um, the hostage more valuable dead than alive. It doesn't make sense, doesn't it? But it does in the case of the Islamic State. Now, why, why were those people beheaded? Well, there are um, several reasons. I mean, the first reason for sure is the propaganda. The beheading of James Foley was uh, an incredibly powerful propaganda tool for the Islamic State among the people in the world that were its sympathizers. It made it look so powerful. I mean, I would say that it's almost as close as the propaganda caused by 9-11. I mean, it was a phenomenal event. It went viral in no time at all. And of course, you know, nobody was prepared for that. So everybody kept you know, sending that thing over and over again, doing exactly what they wanted us to do. So propaganda, number one. I mean, the other thing is that, of course, the Islamic State wanted to lure the US into that conflict. Because that was the best thing that ever happened to them. You know, here we are. The West is bombing us yet again. You know, the West is the enemy, and we are the protector of the people. So the death, uh, the terrible, gruesome death of those hostages uh, was one of the reasons, I would say, was the most important reason why the White House changed its mind and decided to start this grand coalition. So they lured us into that conflict. In the case of the Japanese hostages also, extremely interesting what happened. I mean, in reality, Japan 
was not considered uh, like the US. Um, they, they were negotiating for the release of the hostages, and all of a sudden, the Japanese prime minister you know, went to Cairo, he gave a speech, and in that speech, he, he hinted that he wanted to convince the Japanese to change Article 9 of the Constitution of Japan, which is the one that prevents Japan for, for taking any military action unless, unless it's under direct threat. So it's always for, only for self-defense. So that changed completely, totally, the attitude that the Islamic State had towards the Japanese. They stopped the negotiation, and the Japanese became, like the American, instrument of diplomacy. They were beheaded, and of course, the Constitution, there was no even the debate anymore about the changing of Constitution, of the Article 9 of the Constitution of the Japanese. <coughs> Um, Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. So, you see, the Islamic State got inside our countries, it influenced the public opinion, and achieved what he wanted to achieve. So that's why those hostages were better dead than alive. Well, so, um, of course, after the summer of 2014, um, and uh, the Japanese were, were beheaded in uh, January 2015. Uh, journalists stopped going. Even the freelancers didn't go. All of these guys, of course, were all freelancers. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, those groups that were supplying hostages uh, to the bigger group, um, they were in trouble. So they did exactly the same thing that the groups before them did. They started to traffic people. Now, the bombing campaign caused a massive disruption of people. All of a sudden, from all over Syria, people were trying to flee. Last year, in 2015, over one million people reached Europe, and this is the official figure, so we don't even know how many more actually have crossed. So it was, it was a great business. Here you are. You know, I'm trafficking people now. I'm not kidnapping anybody. I have the cars, I have you know, the vehicles, I have the infrastructure, and of course I have the connections. That's key. The connection. The jihadists in the Sahel had very good connection with Gaddafi and its regime, so they could do the trafficking. These guys had very good connection with the Islamic State. So how did they traffic the people in 2015? They trafficked the people through the caliphate. There are no roadblocks across the caliphate. You enter the caliphate from wherever you, you're coming, and you cross all the way to Turkey. You get to the border in Turkey, and you pay, of course, the Islamic State. Uh, you pay your fee for every single individual that, that leaves the country. You pay your fee. Then you drop the people right across the border. You get to the first place where you can buy supplies, and you smuggle the supply in, and you pay again. The Islamic State is a great business. So in the summer of 2015, <clears throat> the Islamic State was netting, uh, and you'll be shocked now, was netting half a million dollars per day out of this business. More, more than he was earning selling oil or doing anything that you read in the, in the newspapers. So it is a very good business, very good business. It's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. So now we get to the last bit, um, and then you know um, I'll be very curious to, to listen to your question. Globalization. So why all of this has happened? Well, you know, all of this has happened because we live in a globalized world, and then all of a sudden, you know, we had this false sense of security, and you know, people thought, oh my gosh, you know, uh, something is going on in Libya. Oh, I'm going to go to Libya and report this. Um, people thought. Um, 
we can get a shortcut to the profession we want, which can be journalism or can be you know, uh, becoming an aid worker by simply going to a war zone and, and be there. It, I mean, it's a bit like um, the son of my friends. I want to see the world, but I don't want to go and see only the Taj Mahal and enjoy myself. I want to see people suffering and be there for them and help them. Well, this is completely, totally, utterly wrong. Because by doing that, if you're kidnapped, you actually end up funding those guys. Because what do you think they're going to do with the money? It's a really important, important issue. So the responsibility, I'm afraid, it is of, again, of our leaders, um, because they haven't told us how dangerous it is. It's also of the media. I mean, the media in um, Syria took a side. They thought, well, the bad guys um, are the one of Assad, and those guys are kidnapping people which is true, they were kidnapping people. The good guys are the insurgent, you know, the insurgency. And, and of course, you know, we are with them, so they'll be nice to them, because you know, we go there you know, to help them so that the world will know how bad Assad is. Big mistake, big mistake. Because you know, for both of these people, the insurgency and Assad, a foreigner was only worth the ransom. There was no sympathy whatsoever, absolutely not. And it took a long time for the media to realize that actually you know, what they were doing was wrong, that there is no good and evil. Everybody in there is bad. And if you have a, a passport that is Italian or Spanish or German, oh my gosh, you know, you're worth 10 millions much more than your story if it comes out in the Dear Spiegel in El País or La Repubblica. That's the mistake. That's the big, big mistake. So I would say to conclude that the world is not flat, for sure. It's actually shrinking. That's what globalization did to us. It's shrinking because there are many countries where we cannot go anymore. You cannot go trekking in Mauritania anymore. And believe me, I did it when I was young, and it's beautiful. Forget, you're not going there anymore. Too dangerous. But the West is also shrinking. Do you know how many people actually canceled their holidays to France this summer because they were afraid? People don't go to Turkey anymore. People don't go and see the pyramids anymore. They don't go on holiday in the beaches of Tunisia anymore. So this is what is happening. Now, is this what we wanted when we knocked down the Berlin Wall? I don't think so. Not at all. But this is all related to this globalization, to make the world a global village where we can all, all go freely and enjoy ourselves and help the others also. So I think this is just uh, one story. Um, there are many others, many other negative stories. I mean, the Islamic State is the product of globalization also. You know. Absolutely. It's also the consequences of 9-11. Um, but there are so many stories, and the more we learn, the more we understand, the better chances we have to fix this, because this needs to be fixed. But we cannot fix it if we don't know. We cannot fix it if we do not ask ourselves these important questions. Shall a ransom be paid or not? Shall we let our kids go to these areas to explore the world? Shall we let our kids be freelancer? And so on and so forth. So these are really difficult questions, but I think these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. And that's it, I finish.
So what really fascinates me about you is that, uh, you know, you follow how the money goes around. And uh, if you say that this is uh, the third biggest economy, well, then that money has to go somewhere. And uh, there has to be banks to launder this money. And uh, who's getting that money and who's making the profits off of that money? Well, uh, th this is a, a very important question because I'm talking about vast areas of the world. I'm not talking about small areas of the world. So this, this money are actually the money that used in, by the local population. Um, so t take piracy, for example. So the pirates will go, um, will do the hijacking and the kidnapping. They will bring the people and the boat, of course, to a certain port. And then inside the area, they will start uh, you know, spending money, borrowing, of course. The pirates need yeah, the telephone, so it will go and say, okay, you know, can you charge my phone? You know, twenty dollars, and the, and the guy will say yes. You know, of course, you charge your phone. You know, twenty dollars. That will cost you forty dollars, because generally it's you know double. Um, then you will go and buy some food. Then you buy whatever. So, the entire economy is based upon the payment of the ransom. Then the ransom comes, and there are people who do this professionally. So they are accountants that keep a record of all the money they get borrowed. And then they go around and say, OK, you owe this individual this amount of money. You own this individual this amount of money. And that's it. So that's Somalia for you. But the Sahel, exactly the same story. Um, the criminal jihadists go to the villages and they take the children. Um, the child, the parents will give the children away, you know, for maybe six hundred dollars, and then the the child will earn. Um, we're talking about people that are twelve, fourteen. These are children, um, and then they will earn maybe three hundred, maybe four hundred dollars uh, per month, which will keep will keep the entire family alive. Uh, this is how it works. So, um, because these are areas. Uh, Totally, totally destabilized. These are failed states. The, Somalia is not the only failed state. Um, there's massive corruption also in these countries. So a lot of people have to leave because there is no possibility. This is West Africa, East Africa. Um, the Afghanistan. There's a, a lot of kidnapping took place also in Afghanistan. And you know, most of the kidnapping was done by commanders uh, who will control um, a group uh, of fighters. And of course, the fighters all come from the same village, from the same region. And it is responsibility of the commander to maintain, I mean, to help this region uh, to survive because there is nothing else. They don't produce anything. They don't trade anything. These are war zones. So the commander would decide, OK, we kidnap these journalists. We take these journalists. We get this amount of money. Then they get the amount of money. And then they distribute the money. And then they, they may build a road. They may distribute some money to, to the people. So another year will go by, and they will survive. This is how it works. So um, this is not organized crime <coughs> whereby you take the money and then you, you buy a Ferrari. No, this is survival of people, trading people. How bad is it? I have a question about Turkey. Um, Tur Turkey has, um, <laughs> Turkey is very controversial in so many ways, but <coughs> in your story, you. you what you talked about was, um, <clears throat> I assume trafficking means um, people from, say, Syria are trying to get to Europe, and they have to find a way so that their, their, their way of going is facilitated by these people. And you, you mentioned ISIS um, getting them to the um, Turkey-Syria border, for example, and, and then getting across the border. It, do, do the traffickers have um, a, a way of getting them through Turkey so they no. can then go off to Greece, mm. etc.? <clears throat> this is a really... Really good question. It is in the book, of course. So what happened is that 
the traffickers that I have described in this uh, talk, they only take you to the gates of Europe. So either they take you to the south of Italy or you know, they take you to <coughs> the shores uh, of Greece uh, or they take you to Turkey if you come from Syria, also Bangladesh, all the Asians uh, go via Syria by the way. <coughs> so then you get there and it starts <coughs> a new system completely different uh, whereby you have to find uh, the local trafficker. So everything is broken down, everything is decentralized and de deconstructed, meaning somebody will take you from the border of Turkey and Syria to Istanbul. Then from Istanbul to the border of Greece, somebody else will take you there. Then you know, from the border you get to Athens. Then in Athens, somebody else will take you to maybe Italy, then from it, and it goes on and on and on. They all know where to go because it's all, I mean, they have phones, they use you know, the smartphones, so they, it's all on Facebook, it's on Twitter, so they always know where to go. But then, you know, you, it's, it's like the meat market. You go to a bar and there are all these guys there, those are the traffickers, and you go and you start bargaining and they say, okay, you know, you want to go from Istanbul to <coughs> Copenhagen, for example, by plane, it is $20,000. Um, you can try and lots of people succeed. They give you a fake document to get out of Turkey. Then on the plane, there is somebody that travels with you, but of course, you know, not together, who has a real passport. Uh, generally, this passport is either from Ru Romania or Bulgaria, so he has a real European Union passport. Uh, then you land, and when you land, this guy comes next to you, hands over a telephone. You call your family, and you say, I landed in Copenhagen, and the family pays. Uh, is uh, <clears throat> somebody else, <clears throat> who of course is the partner of this guy in Istanbul or wherever, and as soon as they pay, you get handed over the real passport. Then the guy tells you, you go through, if they discover that this is, this is not you, you ask for political asylum right here. If you go through somebody else, on the other side, as soon as you come out of, <coughs> of that luggage, of cast or whatever, will ask you for the passport. And that's how it works. So you go through, let's say, and the guy, somebody else is waiting outside, you come out and the guy comes next to you and say, give me the passport, you give the passport. The passport is used time and time and time again. That's one story. But then, of course, there are people that don't have 20,000. So these people will, will go whichever way they can afford. You can go by boat, you can go by car, you can go hidden inside uh, a truck, you can go underneath a truck. I mean, the stories are unbelievable, unbelievable. But the interesting thing is that we see a complete departure from the um, traditional pyramidal model of organized crime which I think is fascinating because organized crime cannot handle these things. It's too big. It's too big. It's everywhere. But, uh, so, and also modern technology. Modern technology. So you have all these small groups. And, this, and often these groups, you know, they just start doing it. Uh, uh, because the opportunity presents. So all of a sudden, in, in, in Hungary, for example, all of a sudden, when you, last year, all the migrants were, were coming through Hungary, all of a sudden, all the small criminals of Hungary got organized in no time at all. They got the cars, they got you know, the, the app on the telephone, and they started to move people from the border to Germany, drop them there in Germany. And then you know, somebody in Germany would take them and also. Shocking. Shocking. Okay. <clears throat> Do you think that ISIS can be eliminated or even contained 
And if you were president of our great country here, oh my gosh, what no way. would your solutions be? Are there any solutions? No, I, I, I don't think ISIS can be eliminated. Um, I think maybe we could eliminate uh, um, this version of ISIS for uh, some time, but then it will come back. I mean, the, the problem is that there is a need in that part of the world to reinvent completely politics. Um, and ISIS uh, uh, clearly is the, is the organization that has offered the best possible uh, model, I would say, because they're nationalistic, because you know, they have a very strong sense of the state. But it's also true that this is a region that has been plagued by war for so long that, of course, it's extremely, extremely violent. Um, so I would say that the next reincarnation of ISIS, if there will be one, will be even more brutal than, than the one we see now. Um, I would say that the best possible way is to negotiate. I mean, look, I said this, when did I come here? I think a year and a half ago. And I said, one of the most important danger of what is happening is the destabilization of other countries. And look what's happening in Turkey. I mean, we have de facto a dictatorship now in Turkey. I mean, we have a leader in Turkey that wants to reintroduce the death penalty, who has uh, arrested over 10,000 people for a coup that we don't even know who staged it. So that's the destabilization of Turkey for you. Uh, democratic country, a country that was very westernized, that all of a sudden is sucked into this process of destabilization. Um, because, of course, you know, Erdogan thought this is a great opportunity. Um, then the, the same thing could happen to, I think, Lebanon also is highly, the south of Lebanon is highly destabilized. So the entire region um, is uh, a risk of becoming uh, another Syria. Um, I don't think we can afford that. It's too close to Europe, absolutely too close to Europe. So I would say that peace is the solution, but what, do you want to know what I think about the elections on this? <laughs> I think if Hillary Clinton wins the election, there will be more war in the Middle East because what? more war because she will go into it seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, if uh, Donald Trump wins the election, he may make a deal with Putin and then there will be no war, but there'll be repression. So this is to none of this. It's going to be good. <laughs> Two, question. Two questions. Number one, um, I don't really know anything about kidnapping. I'm just wondering when they do go, when the groups go do these things, do they identify people in advance or they just say, hey, this person looks like they're not from around here. We're going to grab them and then figure out where they're from and ask for money. And then um, second, you kind of referred to the role of technology in this. Has that sped this up, made it easier to do? How has that kind of changed the kidnapping world? Uh, well, the, the kidnapping happens uh, <clears throat> because, of course, a foreigner in a certain kind of regions, uh, uh, is uh, you can spot it immediately. Um, most of the people, of course, were freelancers, so they go there um, because they wanted to find uh, Ah, the best possible story to sell to the newspaper. Now, um, all the major newspapers, all the um, traditional media, uh, all the professional journalists do not go to these areas anymore. They haven't gone there for a long time because, of course, the insurance is too high, absolutely too high, and, and, and newspapers cannot afford to spend that kind of money. So it's all down to freelancer. So the freelancer, of course, <laughs> will try their best, but you know, they're inexperienced, but also the, they're people that are, are de I wouldn't say desperate all the time, but 
they need the story. If they don't get the story, they don't get paid. So they, they make mistakes. Um, aid workers, uh, professional aid workers is a completely different thing from uh, people that just want to go and help. I mean, you remember, you know, that Kyla Miller, uh, she was not a professional aid worker. She she was not working for anybody when she was kidnapped. I mean, she she went to Aleppo with her boyfriend. Uh, it was the first time that she went to Aleppo. They were living near the border in Turkey, and she wanted to experience uh, um, uh, what was happening in Aleppo so she could write it in her blog. Uh, she was super, super well-intentioned, but she was not a professional. Um, a professional would not have done it because it was too risky, absolutely too risky. So um, I, I think that in those areas it's very easy if you are a foreigner uh, to be spotted and to be kidnapped. Um, in terms of technology, um, yes, I think you know, technology, of course, uh, is helping a lot because, for example, in the case of communication, see, now... Um, it's very easy to communicate immediately. You don't need to hold the hostage for a very long time um, because you get the hostage, take the phone of the hostage, go through the contacts. Uh, this happens all the time, by the, by the way. Um, it also happened in the case of Kyla Miller. So go through the phone, re recognize a name, um, an Arab name, uh, they call that the, the person. They call and say, look, you know, we have so-and-so. And, of course, this person speaks Arabic. Um, if you're lucky, and y if you're lucky and you have left instructions, if something like this happens, uh, you, can, you can get out within 24 hours, maybe three days, uh, spending $5,000, $10,000, but you need to know what you have to do. Because those guys will take the money, no problem. But most of the time this doesn't happen because you know, they call somebody, they somebody then gets in touch with the authorities of the country. The authorities of the country sit on this, on this for a long time because they have to decide uh, who is in charge, or how we're going to do, we have to talk to the family. And sometimes there are so many people kidnapped. The Italians in 2011, there are 19 people, 19 people kidnapped simultaneously, almost in a few months. So they didn't have the stuff to process all of this. But the, in general, I would say, 99% of the cases, governments, uh, um, the government strategy is take time, let's see, let's wait, and that is when things go wrong. Because then, of course, the group does not want to hold the hostage, then people start getting angry, then people start beating up the hostages, uh, they start raping the women, because, you know, believe me, it happens all the time. And then, in the end, they decide to sell it to somebody else, bigger. And that somebody else, of course, has the structure, the infrastructure to keep the hostage, that's it, that's done. So that's why what they say in, in a kidnapping the, is called the golden hour. Those are the few hours and few days right after the kidnapping. If you can get them out, or you can find where they are within those hours, that's great. Then then you are for the long haul. So do you think paying is the easiest way to get somebody out? Sorry? Is paying the ransom the easiest way to get somebody out? No, I don't think so. I don't think that paying the, I mean, you know, I think paying the ransom is, there was a woman called Amanda Lintol. She wrote a, a very interesting book. Uh, I think it's called The House in the Sky. And she was kidnapped by, in Somalia and she was there for almost two years, she's Canadian. And she said, <clears throat> if you keep feeding the bears, the bears keep coming for more food. And I think that really summarized very much what uh, it's all about. Um, the problem is that it's sufficient that one person feeds the bears, 
you can have the entire camp <laughs> not feeding the bear, but one person feeding the bear, and the bears will keep coming. So how do you, it's, it's a bit like terrorism, it's the same story. How do you get global governance? How do you get people to be united, a total front united uh, hmm? uh, in the fight against terrorism, in the fight against uh, the kidnappers? Uh, as long as you have one government, uh, there will go. Families is a different thing. Families is a different thing. I mean, it's normal. It's human that you want your loved ones to come back home. Those are families. But families don't have that kind of money. I mean, families do not have 10 million. Do you know the last, the two, the last two girls that were, because they were girls, they were 121 and 122, they were brought back by the Italians. The Italians paid 13 million euros. 30 million euros. I mean, which kind of family has that kind of money? So, um, unfortunately, the, this is uh, what is happening. Sorry to have given you. I oh, know, sorry. Sorry. Please join me in thanking our speaker.